So as we've said, uh, the story is obviously based off of the original book by Rajar Kipling. And Kipling wrote the book because he was very much influenced here by the stories of India. So he was born and raised in the British Raj at the time of like the you know, British Empire there. And he was really fascinated by Indian culture and by Indian tales. So he took influences from these and created stories of his own. However, the thing is that Disney decided that he was going to do this and he decided he was going to do this on the behest of Bill Peet. So Bill Peet, as we said, uh, he was the one uh, who wrote the script for uh, The Sword in the Stone. But just before he ended up doing this, uh, Bill Peet kind of convinced uh, Disney that for the animator's sake, for the sake of the animation uh, department, that they should make a film which is wholly centred on animals. So that was something which uh, Disney was really excited by. But he decided that he wasn't going to stick too, too closely to the original books and instead was going to go off of the 1942 film, which was done by Alexander Corder. So it took almost 10 years to uh, win the kind of uh, legal rights for this book, but eventually he ended up doing this. And this is where work began on making the film. However, there ended up being lots of disagreements between Walt Disney and Bill Peet. And that was mainly because, you know, Bill Peet, he wanted to stick very closely to the actual original story. But Disney was like, it's a little bit too dark. Uh, you know, there's lots of like very confusing kind of like meandering thing. If you ever read The Jungle Book, highly recommend it. But you will see within it, it's like, it, it, it kind of goes all over the place here. Yeah. And also there's characters within like some of the Jungle Book stories, which aren't even based in the jungle. They're not even in India, right? There's like one within the Arctic. It's all very confusing. But anyway, so that's why he kind of decided not to stick too close to the script. So then in January of 1964, Bill Pete ended up quitting, right? So the next uh, writer they got, which was uh, Larry Clemens, uh, he was basically uh, brought in by Disney. And Disney said, whatever you do, don't read the book. Now, he ended up obviously reading the book and he kind of came to the same conclusion that Disney came to, which was that it was very difficult to create a narrative yeah, of, of a story through this. So instead, what uh, Clemens did is he decided that the story was going to be character based because while the original stories uh, were kind of in the same light as uh, Aesop's fables, so it's kind of anthropomorphizing uh, the animals to make them a bit more human like so, so that we as humans can learn from them. Instead, it was going to just be more focused on the story and with the characters driving the story. And also as well, uh, Clemens, uh, he's the one who came up with the innovation of having a girl that Mowgli ends up simping hard for over, right? Uh, and that was the reason that was given for him deciding to stay in the man village as opposed to like being in the jungle. So that little bit was put in for that purpose, right? So um, the thing to kind of note with this though is that this film was the first film that Disney had been really actively involved in since Sleeping Beauty. So like we said in that video in 1959, that film was meant to be his masterpiece. And so after that, when he had uh, 101 Dalmatians and The Sword and the Stone, he kind of was like, okay, we'll just, you know, I'll put my name on it, but I'm kind of just not going to get involved here because that was too much headache. So this was the first time since then that he'd got really involved uh, in the actual making of the film. And when he was in the studio, he actually acted out every single role within this, which is something which he hadn't done since all the way back at the time of uh, making Snow White. So it's quite fitting, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but in his first film, he ended up acting out all the roles, and then in his last film, he ended up doing the same thing. So animation began in 1965, and what was quite uh, unique about this film, as opposed to all the ones that have been beforehand, is that instead of animators being assigned specific characters to work on, instead for this, uh, they would be given whole scenes to kind of work on, right? And uh, they used a xerography, uh, which is what we've uh, described in more detail in 101 Dalmatians. So this is just basically printing the images and stuff. So it ends up being quite streamlined of a process. Now, the casting for this was absolutely huge. And the reason why Disney did this is purposeful, right? Because he wanted, like we said, for it to be character driven and character focused. So that's why they have some really, really big names in this. Like in terms of uh, for the casting, it's absolutely brilliant. So we're going to start off just with the uh, people who haven't been in any other Disney films, right? So we're going to start off with Mowgli, and he is voiced by Bruce Reiferman. So he is the son of the director of this, which is Wolfgang Reiferman. And Bruce, he is also actually the voice of Christopher Robin in the Winnie the Pooh series. So just a little bit of trivia with regard to that. Next, you have Phil Harris, uh, and he is the voice of Baloo. 
And he's also going to appear as the voice of Thomas O'Malley in The Aristocats and also of uh, Little John in uh, Robin Hood. Next, you have uh, George Sanders. So he is the voice of Shere Khan. So he appeared in uh, The Falcon, uh, which is a, a bunch of like classic uh, detective films from about like the 1940s, 1950s. And actually, uh, Shere Khan is actually based off of uh, George Sanders' physiognomy. So that's something kind of quite interesting in terms of like how he talks and how he like moves and stuff, right? Is actually based off of George Sanders' actual uh, character. Then next you have uh, Clint Howard. So he is the voice of Rue in the Winnie the Pooh series. And also when you watch The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, right? You know, like the, the really annoying person uh, who like is kind of the sideman to, to the mayor? Yeah, that's actually him. So obviously he's a bit more grown up then, right? But as a child, he did the voice of Colonel Harty's son. And then next, we're going to talk about all the many, many different voice actors who appeared in many different uh, Disney films, which we've already covered. So you had uh, Sebastian Cobert, and he is the voice of Bagheera. You have Sterling Holloway, and he's the voice of Carr. You have Verna Felton, and she is the voice of one of the uh, elephants. And also as well, this was actually her very last film, because she died in 1966. And then you have uh, J. Pat O'Malley, and he is the voice of Colonel Harty. And finally, uh, you have uh, Ben Wright, and he is the voice of Rama, uh, who is the adopted father of Mowgli. And then, of course, we have to talk about my favourite swing artists of all time, Louis Prima, who is the voice of King Louis. And actually, I really ha uh, recommend that you watch this video, uh, which uh, explains how he was casted and how him and his band came together to make such a swinging scene, right? With regard to uh, the, the I Wanna Be Like You song, right? Absolutely brilliant. Uh, you'll learn so much about him. And also as well, just listen to many of his other songs, right? It's absolutely brilliant guy. And I'm going to talk about him a little bit later on when we talk about the legacy. But yeah, just bear that in mind for now. So anyway, that kind of covers the uh, casting and therefore that covers the story of the studio. But now we have to talk about the uh, themes and the history of the film. So the main themes that kind of like run throughout uh, uh, Kipling's uh, Jungle Book series is to do with abandonment followed by a fostering. So Mowgli many, many times ends up being abandoned, but then he ends up being fostered by kind of a father figure of some sort, right? He ends up kind of uh, you know, trying to copy different things and trying to be more like different things. And so that's kind of a theme that kind of goes throughout the thing. And also as well, there's the kind of very interesting look at uh, man versus nature. So at the time uh, when uh, Kipling was writing this, uh, a lot of things were very kind of Darwinian, right? So it's this idea of the struggle of, of life, yeah, right? You know, the survival of the fittest. But Kipling kind of looked at it in a more ancient way in terms of Aesop's fables. And so, like we said, he kind of anthropomorphizes the animals. So it's a way for humans to learn how to be a man through looking at animals, right? So that's kind of a recurring uh, theme which is throughout the film. And then also as well, because it's the 1960s, right, there's many different things which if it had been done maybe 10 years before, it just wouldn't have had the same kind of vibe to it at all. And so obviously you can hear like the, you know, the, the great influence of like swing music. And then also as well, you're seeing a lot of this kind of counterculture uh, kind of like 60s vibe to it, right? So you've got, you know, Baloo talking about, uh, you know, doobies and stuff and he's a very chilled out hippie. But then also as well, you've got the vultures. And if you notice why the vultures look a particular kind of way, that's because originally they were actually going to cast the Beatles to do the Vultures, right? However, John Lennon at the last moment, he kind of was like, no, I don't want to be in any uh, animated films. Although he'd been in like other like films to do like Beatles and stuff. Yeah, right. Like well, they all had. It was a thing where he was like, no, I don't want to do that. So instead they got some other band that I'd never heard of and no one ever has really heard of. And they make up like the kind of like British invasion, so-called, yeah. So in the early 60s, you had lots of people coming from Britain, making it big in America and stuff. So this was one of the many bands that did that. But yeah, their name's on screen now, but I can't remember that at all. So that covers the uh, theme and the history. And now uh, we're going to be talking about the legacy of the film. And the legacy of it is absolutely huge, right? In my opinion, it's like absolute favourite uh, Disney film. Uh, it's just so enjoyable to watch. Like you never have like a bored moment in it. There's so many great lines in it, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. And box office really speaks for itself. 